in John chapter 17, verse 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in, my, in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil they are not of the world even as I am not of the world sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth as thou hast sent me into the world even so have I also sent them into the world and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I am them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me them as thou hast loved me father i will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where i am that they may behold my glory which thou gavest me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world o righteous father the world hath not known thee but i have known thee and these have known that thou hast sent me and i have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Now after speaking to the disciples for, and preparing them for his departure, Christ then turns to our Heavenly Father, turns to God the Father in prayer. And he begins his prayer by asking God to glorify him. In verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. To glorify means to reveal the dignity of and the worth of something or someone. That's what it means to glorify, to reveal the dignity and the worth. When I worked in East Texas at the newspaper office, the, our late owner, the man uh, E.H. Whitehead, he passed away before I went to work there, but he was well known in the area. He was a former state representative. And so his daughter ran the paper. And he had done a number of things in the Texas legislature, had a long political career, but one of the things he did was he got named to Texas Monthly's Worst Legislators list. And nobody talked about that at the office. Nobody. One day, I don't know how I did it. I don't remember what the context was, but I made a, a slight reference to his making the Worst Legislators list. And his daughter, my boss, pulled me into her office, and she explained to me how it was he came to receive that honor from Texas Monthly. You see, she was a student at the University of Texas when he was 
a state representative. And so she got to go to the University of Texas. She majored in, I believe, journalism or public relations, communications, something along those lines. But being in Austin, when her dad was in Austin, she got to go to the Capitol and sit in his seat, you know, and monitor the proceedings of the floor and work with his staff and all that kind of stuff. It was a pretty interesting deal. Anyway, what happened was one, one day, as she was on the University of Texas campus, somebody tried to attack her. And come to find out, the man who tried to attack her was a, ex, was a convict who was living in a halfway house. And the way the police handled the investigation, the, the, where the halfway house was located, what the, in, what the convicts were allowed to do and not, angered my, my boss's father who was in the state legislature. And so he went to the floor of the Texas House of Representatives and he introduced legislation that would establish a halfway house behind the district judge's residence that had sent this inmate to live in this halfway house. Kind of trying to exact revenge for his daughter. Okay, trying to protect his daughter. That's how he made the list of the worst legislators in the state of Texas by Texas Monthly. And every chance that she had and every chance that, uh, that his wife had to talk about what a great man he was, the great things he did, the great things he believed in, the things that he wanted to do, they spoke it. They would share it. They would tell me about how he wanted to create this park in Rusk and how he was real big into state parks and how he was always concerned that the poor widow woman with the children would have something that they would be able to do without having to pay for and, and that sort of thing. And they, they he was, they, they just... They never missed the opportunity to tell me or anybody else who would listen what a great man he was. What were they doing? They were revealing his dignity. They were revealing his worth. They were pointing out all the things that we had in that town because of the work that he had done. They were glorifying him. And in the same way, Christ was asking God to glorify him, to reveal his worth, to reveal his dignity. And this would be accomplished through the gospel. So what Christ is really asking for is the completion of the gospel. He is asking for God's hand to be on him during the crucifixion and for God to resurrect him. The glory of Christ is in the gospel. The revealed dignity and worth of Jesus Christ is in the gospel. The gospel is what makes Jesus renowned. It's what makes him glorious. It's what makes him dignified. It's what makes him tangible to the world. We have a Savior who walked and talked on this earth. He interacted with people. History records his presence. He impacted the world. He changed the world. And history, secular history, records this. There are a lot of different religions and theologies and things that people believe in, and they don't have that level of tangibility. Buddhism doesn't have this level of tangibility. Hinduism doesn't have this level of tangibility. Not even Islam has this level of tangibility. They had the prophet Muhammad, but their Allah never took on the form of man and walked with man and reconciled himself to man. This is something that is unique to Christianity. And the reason we are still talking about Jesus 2,000 years later is because not only was he God in the flesh and he walked and talked on this earth and he impacted the world in a way that no other human being has ever done, but he completed the gospel. He died for our sins on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that death, burial, and resurrection is what makes him renowned, glorious, dignified. It's what puts him in the position today where 2,000 years later we're still talking about him. It's his glorification. When you talk about the glorification of Jesus Christ, you are talking about the gospel. Jesus then notes how he glorified the Father on this earth. In verse 4 he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus said he has glorified God. What did he do? He glorified God. He revealed God's dignity. He made God renowned. He honored and celebrated and extolled the Father. And everything that Jesus did, he taught about the Father. And not only did he teach about the Father, but in everything he did, he revealed the Father. He revealed him, and he made his dignity and his worth known to the people. 
It was his nature to do that because he was God in the flesh. John 1.14 says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It was his nature because he was deity. Jesus Christ was deity. He was God who was made flesh, took on flesh, took on a human body, and walked among us. When you have God in the flesh walking among you, of course he's going to demonstrate who God is. Of course he's going to teach who God is. Of course he's going to reveal God. And of course he's going to reveal the, mag the, the dignity and the worth and the value and the glory of God. Jesus pointed out that he and the Father worked in unison. John chapter 5 verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my Father worketh hitherto and I work. In John chapter 5, Jesus had healed a lame man on the Sabbath. The, the religious leaders didn't think you could do that on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, my Father worketh hitherto and I work. He was and this made the religious leaders mad because in saying that, G, that, Christ, that God was his father, he was making himself equal with God. And that really upset them. But what Jesus, what did Jesus do? He pointed out what God did. God healed. God works. God is still God on the Sabbath. And he demonstrated that by healing on the Sabbath. And he demonstrated God's character and priorities. He told Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know what God's like? You want to know what God thinks? You want to know how God would talk? You want to know how God would react to certain situations? You see how Jesus reacted and what Jesus did and what Jesus said in the four Gospels. And he glorified God by teaching his disciples. In verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me, them me, and they have kept my word. He made God known to the disciples. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. He taught the disciples about God. He taught the disciples God's word. He taught the disciples the true meaning of God's word, the true value of it. He manifested God. He revealed God to the disciples. And after these things, Jesus began to pray for us. In verse 20, Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And so Jesus is praying not only for his disciples that he had walked and talked with, but he's praying for all the future disciples who would come to know him as Savior because of the word and because of the ministry of his 12 apostles or his 11 apostles. And then 12 when we get Brother Paul into the mix. He's praying for all future believers because all of us, all of us owe the fact that we heard the gospel to one of those apostles because they spread it and then it was handed down from generation to generation. Jesus prayed that we'd be kept through God's name, that we'd be kept from evil, and that God would sanctify us. That's what he wants. He wants us kept in God's name, he wants us kept from evil, and he wants us sanctified. Sanctified means to be set aside for God's purpose or his will. Jesus prayed that we will be kept through God's name. In verse 11, Jesus said, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Jesus prayed that God would keep us. Now, the word to keep means to guard against loss, to keep from injury, to keep an eye on. Okay, it means to watch. It means to keep watch over. If you've, if you've ever had livestock, you keep an eye on your livestock. And if you can't be there, you want to make sure they're in a secure pen. Not only that keeps them in, but that keeps the predators out. You're, you, this is a protective situation. Jesus prayed for our protection. He prayed for our spiritual protection, that our salvation would be secure. See, because the word keep means to guard against loss. Jesus doesn't want us lost. If you are one of his children, you are one of his disciples, he does not want to lose you. He wants you to be kept. And Jesus prayed that God would keep us through his name. Keep us through his name by his authority, but also by keeping us, his name would be glorified. The fact that our salvation is secure, the fact that we cannot lose our salvation, has nothing to do with who we are and everything to do with who God is. 
and God is glorified, his dignity and his worth and his magnitude is revealed by the fact and his grace and his love and his mercy and his forgiveness all revealed by the fact that he keeps us saved, that he keeps us from falling aside. Moses appealed to this in Ezekiel chapter 32. Moses went up on Mount Sinai. God gave him the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down. What's the, what's the, the first commandments talking about not to make a graven image? Moses comes down off the mountain and look, they've already made a golden calf and they're worshiping it. That was not a happy day. And God's anger was kindled against the Israelites. And God said, you know, step out of my way, Moses. I'm going to consume them and I'm going to give you another nation. And look what Moses did. In, ver in Exodus chapter 32, verses 12 through 13, Moses said, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief? Did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn away from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and says unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Mo Moses pointed out that if God followed through on his threat, the Egyptians, and on a broader scale, the Gentiles, would think that God was evil. Now that's kind of a, mis a mischievous thing to do, isn't it? That's kind of a twisted thing to do, to call your people out of a nation, to free them out of a nation, to bring them through the Red Sea, to destroy that nation in the process, bring your people out, take them into the wilderness, and then destroy them. What kind of God does that? That's not who our God is. And that's what Moses was pointing out to God. This is not who you are. And furthermore, if God did that, he wouldn't be following through on his promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or, or as we know him in the Old Testament, Jacob. And so when he was reminded, when, when, when Moses, now this was a test for Moses, I believe, but Moses pointed out that if God destroyed his people in the wilderness, his name would not be glorified. So God didn't destroy Israel in the wilderness. God wants his name glorified. He wants his name to be revealed. He wants to be revealed to people. He wants his dignity and his worth and his greatness and his grace and his mercy and his power. He wants that revealed in the earth and he wants his people to do the revealing. And therefore he secures our salvation. Because if he couldn't secure our salvation, there's really not much he could do for us. So Jesus prayed that we would be kept through his name. Jesus then prayed that God would keep us from the evil. In verse 15, Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but, thou, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now my life application Bible here, the word evil, there's a little footnote, and you go down to the bottom, it tells you what these words mean sometimes. And so my little footnote here says evil, and then colon, and what it's supposed to mean says evil. So my life application Bible says the word evil means evil. I'm glad that we were able to straighten out that word study. Um, evil, we dig, so I had to get out the Strongs and the Thayers. Um, evil means peril. It means a time of total peril. And, and what this means in this context would be a time of total peril for Christianity. In verse 14, the verse before this, Jesus said, I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. In verse 14, Jesus acknowledged that the world would hate his disciples because they were not of the world. And we discussed this recently. We discussed how the world hates us because we're not of them, we're of Christ. And we discussed how when the world hates us, and the world does hate us, with that hatred from the world comes persecution. And the disciples, very quickly after the death of Jesus, would endure intense persecution. Jesus was not praying that each and every disciple would be shielded from persecution. He was not praying that each and every individual disciple would be shielded from bad things happening to them. Because if that were the case, then we could clearly show through history that that prayer request by Jesus was ignored by God. 
And we know that as holy as Christ is, as righteous as he is, as obedient as he was to God and being God's only begotten son, and that he's the great intercessor for us, he pleads on our behalf, we know that God listens to his prayers. We know that God listens to his requests and he grants them. That's why Jesus told us to pray in his name, so that God will grant the prayer request. We look in the history, how many of those disciples were, were murdered, were martyred, were persecuted? How many martyrs have we had through the centuries? How many through the centuries? How many millions of people have died for the name of Christ? What about today? In America, we just have to deal with verbal confrontation for the most part. Overseas, we've still got people dying in horrible ways. Well, I thought Jesus prayed to keep them from the evil. What Jesus was praying for was his disciples collectively. The world outnumbers us. The world outnumbers us, and the world hates us. And the world wants to eradicate us. They don't want Jesus mentioned in public. They don't want Christianity to have any influence in society, especially not public policy. You can't believe how many times I've been involved in a political discussion, a discussion of policy, a discussion of which direction that this country and this state should go when I, and I speak out on something like abortion or I speak out on something like gay marriage and I'm told, well the only reason you think that is because of your religion, therefore you should just shut up. They don't want Christianity, they don't want the Lord to have any influence on our society. They, they don't want any part of it. They want to eradicate us. Remember, we live in a post-Christian society, a society that thinks that they've tried uh, Christianity and they don't like it, and so they've rejected it. They outnumber us. They hate us. They want to eradicate us, but they can't. They can't because God is honoring the prayer request of his only begotten son that we would be kept from the evil. The world wants to eradicate Christianity, and they want to eradicate it. In America, they want to eradicate it by making it look stupid. But the more they speak out against it, the more it gives us the opportunity to, to proclaim what the gospel is and what we really believe and to talk about our Lord that much more. Overseas, they want to kill all the Christians. And the more they try to cr kill the Christians, the more people are being saved and the more Christianity is growing. Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds in China. And there's intense persecution there. You, do, you look at how faithful the Christians who were in those countries where they were being persecuted, you look at their faith and their strength and their commitment, and people notice that and they're accepting Jesus as their Savior as a result of the work and the sufferings of those Christians. The more the world tries to eradicate Christianity, the more Christianity spreads. And that is because God is answering his son's prayer that we will be kept from the evil. We may be outnumbered in the world, but the world will not be able to swallow us. The Bible says in John chapter 1, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. That word comprehends means to overtake, to consume, to, to, to conquer. The light shines in the darkness. Christianity shines in the darkness of this world, and the darkness of this world wants to overtake. Christianity wants to snuff it out, but the world cannot. So Jesus prayed that we would be kept from the evil. And then Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. To sanctify means to separate from profane things and to be dedicated toward God. And Jesus prayed that we would be separated from profane things. He prayed that we would be separated from our sin that we would be set apart from our sin, that, that, that our sin would be removed from us. See, it does matter how you live. God's will and, and the will of Christ is not that you continue to walk in darkness. It's not that you continue to live a lifestyle of sin. It's not that you continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. God wants you separated from that sin. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, let us lay aside the sin Oh, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which so easily besets us. He wants us to lay it aside. He wants us sanctified. He wants us set apart from the world. Christians should look like Christians. Christians should not look like the world. Now, we, 
I mean, in some cases we dress the same. We have a tendency to wear shirts and pants and, and dresses and hats and that sort of thing. It's not necessarily a wardrobe issue. But people ought to look at your life. Now, there are some things that the world wears that a Christian should never find themselves wearing. And there are some things that the world does to their body that a Christian should never find themselves doing to their body. But what I'm talking about is a lifestyle and a heart issue. There ought to be a, a markable difference between you and the rest of, your, of the world. We're not supposed to resemble the world. And one of the problems with contemporary Christianity as I see it, now this is from the book of Leland, one of the problems with cre contemporary Christianity as I see it is contemporary Christianity is trying so hard to look like the world, to resemble the world, to fit into the world, so it can convince the world that it's relevant and that it has something to offer them. And that's a problem. That's not what God called us to do. Jesus prayed that we'd be separated from profane things, that we'd be separated, and that we'd be dedicated to God. Our purpose for being here should be to serve God. Our mission should be to serve God's mission. You have a life's purpose. You have a reason for being here. God has not called you home. You are not dead. Now, you may feel dead some days. You may feel dead this morning. You may say, I wish Leland would hurry this thing up. You may feel dead. But you're looking at me, so you're not dead. All right? And since you're not dead, and since you're not gone, since you are still here, and God hasn't forgotten about you, he hasn't forgotten to call you home, you still have a purpose. You still have a mission in life. And that mission that you have in life is God's mission. But Brother Leland, I'm too old. God doesn't think you're too old. If he thought you were too old, he'd call you home. Now, what your role in that mission is, it changes. There are some things you can't do now that you could do 20, 30 years ago. I don't think there's anybody in here older than 40 or 50, so I'm just going to say 20 or 30. There are some things that you can't do now that you could do years ago, but there are still some things you can do. And God leads you in those directions. So Jesus prayed that we would be separated from pro things and dedicated to God's service. And that's what it means to be sanctified. You know why we call this a sanctuary? Because this room is set aside and dedicated for the worship of the Lord and the preaching of his word. It's not because, you know, you think of an animal sanctuary. We're not running an animal sanctuary in here or a wildlife sanctuary. This is a sanctuary in the sense that it is set aside for that specific purpose. God sanctifies us through truth, which is the word. Notice Jesus prays that, the Lord, that God would sanctify them. He doesn't say, God, I pray that they'll one day sanctify themselves. He says, God, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. You know, some people believe that sanctification happens when you kick the habit and you walk the line. If I can just give up this, I'll give up this, and then I'll do these things that the preacher says I'll do. If I do those, I'll be sanctified. But if you are doing that apart from God's word, you are still living in the flesh. And the Bible teaches that living in the flesh does not please God. Even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Us on our best day doing our best work without Christ, we're still repulsive to God. It is the word that sanctifies us. It is the word that sets us apart. It builds our faith. From the inside out, the word sets us apart and sanctifies us, beginning in our heart, and that expresses itself through our actions. And it builds our faith in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to be sanctified? You want to be set apart for God? You want to be pleasing to God? You have to have faith. You have to have strong faith. And how do you get that strong faith? You get that strong faith by being in his word. His word instructs us. Now, this is, this is a new take on these verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, that teaches you how to be sanctified. That's the, God's word working in your life, correcting the things you need to correct, instructing you to do the things you ought to be doing. But notice what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 17. I never thought of this until I was looking at this through the lenses of sanctification. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, that the man of God, or the woman of God, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect means complete 
thoroughly furnished means to be completely equipped unto what? Unto all good works. That's sanctification. Verse 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about separating you from the profanity of your life, from the sin of your life. And verse 17 talks about you being set aside and equipped for God's service. That is sanctification. You want to be sanctified? Get in the word. In 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I didn't just throw that in there because, we, because we're talking about the word of God. I threw that in there because our mission at the end of the day, you know, we do a lot of things. Vacation Bible school. We, we hand out tracts. We, we you know, do food ministries on occasion. There are a lot of things that we do. Christianity does a lot of things. But at the end of the day, the mission is the spread of the gospel. If you're going to be able to effectively spread the gospel, you need to know the gospel. If you want to know the gospel, you have to be in the word. So that's what Jesus prayed for. He prayed that we would be kept, that we would be secured, basically, that we would be kept from the evil. That means that the powers of Satan would not be able to snuff us out. And he prayed that we would be sanctified, set apart for his service and his purpose. In verse 18, Jesus said, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Christ glorified God. Remember, that means to demonstrate the worth or the dignity of something. Christ glorified God. God glorified Christ in the gospel. And Jesus is here praying for us. Why? So we can spend our lives here glorifying God. So we can reveal the dignity and the worth of God and make his name renowned. So that we can speak to Christ of Christ, who he truly is, and speak that to the world so we can glorify him. So we can glorify Christ and glorify God by spreading the gospel. So we can demonstrate who God is through our actions. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And that's our mission on earth, to glorify God. And what that means is we are constantly demonstrating who he is through our words and through our actions. Is that a mission and a purpose you are willing to embrace with your life? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us, Father. We pray that you would, that you would work in our lives, that you would sanctify us through your word, that you would remove us from the profane things in our lives, Father, and that you would Set us on the course to be used by you in mighty ways. Father, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. We ask you to be with us as we go forward from here now that you would keep us encouraged to do your will. And Father, we ask you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.